That's what I do to my students. <laughs> Morning. 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 My name is Michael DePew. I'm pastor of Telford Missionary Baptist Church in Telford, Tennessee. I teach history, humanities, and philosophy at East Tennessee State University. But most importantly, I'm Lynette's husband. <laughs> Lucky girl. <laughs> <laughs> On behalf of the family, I want to express our gratitude uh, for your coming uh, to this memorial service. Sorry, Derek, I'll wander. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't print an order of service. Uh, I'm going to open us in prayer. Lynette is going to lead in a, a song, uh, which the words are printed in your uh, in the little flyer. Um, and then we're going to have uh, some time of, this is a memorial service, and so we're going to remember um, if anyone wants to, um, you can uh, relay for us a fond memory. I'll start. I'll make it. I'll, I'll be the first one. Uh, it, uh, it involves little guy. <laughs> but that's how we'll start. I know, I can't say little Doug, but... <laughs> we are glad you're here. Um, and so... Let's open in prayer, and we'll sing, and we'll get started. Father, thank you for this opportunity to come and commemorate the life of Lois and to minister to one another and to share with each other uh, these fond memories. I pray, Father, that you'll help us. I pray the Holy Spirit of God will come and comfort our hearts and encourage our hearts and fill us with joy as we celebrate this life. Thank you, Father, uh, for your love and for your grace. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. You guys are going to sing with me because I'm not singing this long. I'll just sing here and cry. We're going to do In the Garden. And I know the thing is So if you need to look through your Bible. <laughs> <laughs> Passing our glasses. Okay. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear calling on my ear the sun discloses and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joys we share as we tarry there none other has ever And the sound of his voice is so sweet, the birds hush their singing, and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing, and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joys we share we tarry there none other has ever known I didn't give you the rest of our order of service <laughs> Because after our memorial service, I'm going to preach. I am a Southern Baptist preacher. We never <laughs> miss an opportunity to preach. So, uh, and then we'll sing another song and we'll be dismissed. Okay, this is a time for the memorial portion. I wore this shirt especially for this time. Why? <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm going to cry. <laughs> and Lynette was in college in the great state of Tennessee. Uh, we met and we had started dating. Her ride back to New York for Christmas fell through. And that was my opportunity to be Prince Galahad, right? <laughs> to step forward and say, I can take you. And so I did. And so we, we, I drove her up to New York and I think, let's see, Doug was there and little guy, little guy was there. This has been 30, 35 years ago. <laughs> little guy was there and Connie was there and Lynette was introducing me to everybody. You know, and I was shaking hands. And then her mom walks in, Lois walks in. And she walks in, and it's like the parting of the Red Sea, the sun's part. <laughs> and there she was, and Lynette said, and this is my mom. I'm from Tennessee. And I saw her, and I said, mom, <laughs> like that. And I reached up and gave her a great big hug. And you would have thought I had electrocuted her. <laughs> she went. <laughs> and I was, and uh, I, I, you know, I didn't want to jump back or anything to make it like it was awkward or something. Uh, but it was like, it's Christmas time. And so I stayed up there because I was going to, Lynette had work study or something. We had to come back. And uh, Lois went shopping because there wasn't a present for me, right? And it was Christmas Eve, was it? She went out on Christmas Eve. And when I, when we, the presents were being opened, she said, oh, Mike, this is for you. And I'm like, she didn't even know I was coming. And she handed me this package and I opened it. And it was the first pink shirt I had ever owned. <laughs> it was the first pink shirt I ever owned. <laughs> and the really humorous part is for the next five years, every Christmas, Lois bought me a pink pink shirt. <laughs> and so I bought a pink shirt. I bought a pink shirt. <laughs> I am I am actually twice the man I was <laughs> thirty-five years ago, so I had to get another pink shirt. <laughs> But uh, she took the time during Christmas to go and get a stranger in her house who was apparently stealing her daughter away. <laughs> uh, she went and got me a Christmas present. And that, that thrilled me. And so I wanted to share that with you. So if anybody else... Because if nobody has anything, I'm just going to preach my long sermon. <laughs> Aunt Mary, the lovely Aunt Mary. I appreciate it, but I would expect Lois to do that. <laughs> or have a spare one in the closet someplace and just wrap it. But anyway, the only thing I, the most thing I remember about Lois is her smile and that little laugh, that little chuckle when she didn't quite get the joke, but she knew she was supposed to be laughing at it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yeah. Um, um, I don't think we're married even yet. And Lois and Al, her husband at the time. And we all were, she was the most hospitable person ever. And we got really close talking, and a lot of times we were there together. And had a foot gut and rot, you know. You know? <laughs> that was a big thing. And we play cards or whatever. And they come to our house and you know, and stuff. It was wonderful. And helped to her with her children, and she was having them on that and then different ones. And um, it was we had the most wonderful fellowship and friendship. And I really appreciate that. Thank you. Yes, I had the pleasure of spending a lot of time with Lois over the years. Um, she was a great friend of mine. We enjoyed a lot of the same things. And um, as Lois got sick, Jim asked me to help care for her. And um, it's so hard 
to watch someone who was so vital in life to <coughs> lose all that to a disease. And, but um, she still enjoyed certain things. And by the time I came to really take care of Lois, there wasn't much pleasure in her life. She couldn't do much anymore. But the one thing that I found she seemed to enjoy, a lot of times when the television was on, she was just staring at it or just ignoring it. But every time a commercial come on with a cute little jingle, <laughs> she would respond and start singing. <laughs> And I know that she's always liked hymns and such, so I started playing hymns for her and things like that. And she still could enjoy the music, and I was glad to be able to give her one thing that put a smile back on her face. Anyone else? She was my wife, and she made my life the most beautiful. I wrote this when we were uh, all together at the end there. Um, we all understand some of the stuff in it, but mom was a uh, she was crazy. She took us to she took us all to Nebraska on a bus. <laughs> all of us. And uh, that is crazy. It was a crazy trip, you know, on a great house. That was the longest trip ever to get there and to get back. But, uh, I almost wasn't able to get back on at one point. Because <laughs> I lost my ticket. <laughs> 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 We're not going to come. Anymore. But she also um, took us to Washington, D.C. once, and, uh, and Bud was... He didn't, he didn't care to go to Washington, D.C., but she took six kids and a 72 Impala, two-door Impala, to <laughs> Washington, D.C. for the, a long weekend. And uh, that just, she just had a spirit and a drive that was just, I, you can't, can't describe it. And the, uh, the little jingles, she would always, we always had to, not had to, but we always sang in the car all those little jingles. We all know them songs. Mm -hmm. and, um, oh, and that said you and Guy were going to sing you know, <laughs> the Woodstocker song. Yeah, yeah. That might not be appropriate. Here. <laughs> I don't have my glasses, so I'll, I'll struggle through this here. Well, maybe I can borrow yeah. <laughs> Andy's, Andy's look for it. That worked. Okay, this was my. If you can't say anything nice, you don't say anything at all. My home. Where it start? Where it? Where to start? It's hard to say. So many memories come our way. You taught us all so very much. Even at the end, with your gentle touch. You taught us faith and how to pray. We try to do it every day. You taught us forgiveness. You were so kind. Your special light always shined. You taught us to travel, to go far. And if you get bored, sing in the car. <laughs> you taught us all not to bus. Even hauling five kids across the country on a bus. You taught us courage and strength, just we all could see when you drove a car with six kids to D.C. Your humor, your laughter, your smile, we will never forget. The songs and sayings you taught us, our kids all know I bet. We were all so blessed to have you as our mom. You're the reason so many grandkids will carry on. Mom, we are so grateful for all you have shown. 
but now your father has called you home. We love you, Mom, and we will, we will miss you so. Now it's time for you to go. That's it. Such a poet. <laughs> I just have a funny story that um, I think I can get through, but we were Christmas shopping. We always went shopping on Saturday. And um, one time we were either in Ames or James Way, I don't know which one it was, but Christmas music was playing, and all of a sudden, Mom grabbed my coat and pulled me down, and we're both on the floor, and I'm like, What in the world? She said, it said, fall on your knees. <laughs> and what she has been waiting for that. <laughs> But she didn't open the can. <laughs> We're all sitting here and waiting for the beans, hitting the forks. All at once, the oven door blew off. And, the beans all <laughs> and uh, we got the beans. <laughs> so those were two blast beans. <laughs> chance to share. One yeah. time we, we were, um, like on Sundays, we, Bud would have people just drop by the house random, you know, and of course we lived kind of far out, so um, she was making chicken and dumplings but didn't have any flour, so she used oatmeal. <laughs> so they'll never know. <laughs> They ate it. <laughs> I think of myself as quite the cook, but I'm not sure, I'm not sure if I can turn it on the other side. She said, they didn't say anything. Yeah. <laughs> Lois was a formidable woman. Look at these guys. Right? Um, and she will be missed. Uh, by her own confession, she was a Christian. And so, um, anybody else have anything to say? I just want to make sure I don't want anybody to, to not share if they feel like we should. Okay. Um, I'm just going to read a few verses, talk about the gospel, and then we'll uh, close in a song. So let's go ahead and pray. Father, thank you. We thank you, Lord, for sending your son to die for us. We thank you, Father, uh, for giving us your word. We thank you, Lord, for the life that Lois led before our children. And I pray, Father, that you would uh, have your will and way in this service. Help us, O Spirit of Comfort, to... Uh, to celebrate this life. Because as Paul said, we don't grieve as the world does. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Paul in 1 Thessalonians. See, this question, this question about, about passing, about death, is something that bothers all of us, right? Um, and it's uh, what leads the... Uh, the uh, writer of Ecclesiastes to talk about how there's wisdom, there's wisdom in a house of mourning, because it's in times like these that cause us to think about these eternal things. In the city of Thessaloniki, uh, Paul's writing this letter because apparently they had the same questions. And he says in chapter 4, he says, but we would not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope.
For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, uh, even so God will bring him uh, with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. This is a promise for Christians that this time isn't the end. This is momentary. This is fleeting. This is passing until our reunion. Until our reunion. There are those who grieve without hope. The world, they grieve without hope. Their best thought in the world is that it's over. It's done. That's the best <coughs> that the world can hope for. The worst is that maybe those crazy Christians are right. The thing that makes the difference between those who grieve with hope and those who grieve without hope is the gospel. And Paul said in Romans, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection. It's the good news. It's the good news. The problem for us is, before the good news means anything, we have to understand the bad news. Okay? It's the difference in between be believing in God and believing God. I'll use myself as an example. When I was in high school, me and a buddy of mine, I can't even remember why, we went to this preacher, and we were worried about something, I think, I told a Khomeini or something like that. We were uh, teenagers. I thought the world was coming to an end. And the preacher there, well-meaning, I'm sure. Well-meaning, I'm sure. He said, no, 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 no. This isn't the end of the world. And he explained everything. He said, let me ask you a question. Do you believe that Jesus came and was born of a virgin? And I thought to myself, well, yeah, Christmas, right? So, yeah, I believe that. I'm, I'm with it. And he says, do you believe that Jesus uh, died on a cross and was raised on the third day? And I thought, Easter. Yeah, I believe that. And he said, welcome to the kingdom of God. Because I believed in God. He was wrong. It wasn't until I was 22, 23 years old until I found out he was wrong. Because it's one thing to believe in God, right? Well, the demons, James tells us, believe in God, but they tremble. They tremble. The thing is to believe God, like Abraham. God said, Abraham, take your son, your only son, the son whom you love, up onto this mountain and offering to me as a burnt sacrifice. Abraham already believed in God. But God had promised Abraham that this was the son of the promise. And if God wanted him to do this, then God would have the power to raise one even from the dead. Book of Hebrews says Abraham's actions demonstrated he believed God. Adam and Eve, from the very beginning of sin entering into the world, Adam and Eve sinned and they were cursed by God. First, God looked at the looked at Adam and he said, "Oh, cursed are ye the ground because of you. Thorns and thistles it'll give you when you go to harvest." By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your bread of painful labors. Not much good news there. Told Eve, you know, you will be pain in childbirth, but your desire will be for your husband. And then God looked at the serpent and said, Cursed are you above all the animals. And in the midst of this curse to the serpent, 
God said, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, between her seed and your seed, and he, see that gender change? And he will crush your head and you will bruise his heel. That's the first mention of Christ in the Bible. To come to eliminate the problem of sin in the world. The first promise in the book of Genesis. So, Adam was cursed. No good news. Eve was cursed. No good news. The serpent was cursed. There's this one sliver of promise. The very next chapter, Adam names his wife. What does he name her? That wretched woman who gave me that apple to eat, does he name her that? He names her Eve, <coughs> which means the mother of life. Life. Why? Because through Eve, the answer would come to the death. Through Eve, through her seed, he will crush the serpent. Adam believed God. How do we know? He named his wife Eve. We know he believed God because nothing in what God told him was going to happen to him was positive in any way. <coughs> to dust you will return because from dust you were taken. There's a difference between believing in God and believing God. You see, because one of our problems in our culture, we think that we are infinitely self-perfectible. We can fix ourselves. You need evidence? Go to a bookstore. Largest section in a bookstore? Self-help. This is how you fix yourself. Right? The problem is, Paul tells us in Romans 5, that we are helpless. And while we were helpless, God sent his son. We were sinners. While we were still sinners, God sent his son. We had made ourselves the enemy of God. And while we were the enemies of God, Christ came to reconcile us back to the Father. Sort of a thumbnail of Romans chapter 5. The difference between grieving with hope, because we're going to be sad. We're going to be sad. If I try to make Lynette speak again, she's going to cry. Because, and if I get on the wrong topic, I'm going to cry. But that is what I want you to take home. In this time of mourning, when you're thinking about these eternal things, we can't perfect ourselves. <laughs> the whole world, I told you what I teach, the whole world has always thought we can perfect ourselves. Plato, Socrates believe that we sin because of ignorance. If we can only get a better education. Aristotle thought we just have bad habits. If we could get ourselves some better habits, right? Sigmund Freud. That's what Bill and Ted called him. Freud, dude. Sigmund Freud believed that guilt was illegitimate. He said there really isn't any such thing as guilt. The only thing we have is neuroses because you repress yourselves. You repress your impulses. And you have neuroses. And so he just says, ignore your guilt. There comes a time when you can't ignore the guilt. The one thing that all human beings share in common is that we're sinners and we're helpless and we're sinners and we are at enmity. We are enemies of God in that condition. Only God sending his son could alleviate that for us. And so as we leave, I want you to think about that because it's only in turning to Christ understanding the bad news first because until you understand that you're lost 
The good news makes no sense. The good news is only Christmas and Easter. And you get candy. Right? The world doctors it up so it looks really pleasant. So. I didn't want to take up an offering. <laughs> or have an altar call. But as you go home, think about these things. Pray. God will hear. God will answer. Because he said, Paul, we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Christ died and rose again, even so God will bring them with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you for this opportunity to share your word. I thank you, Father, for Lois's life. She behaved herself a mother to me whenever she saw me. And I thank you, Lord, for that experience. I thank you, Father, for my wife and for her family. I pray, Lord, that you'll help us today as we contemplate these things, as we contemplate Lois's life. Help us, Father, to continue to share with one another and to encourage one another and to uplift one another and to celebrate this life. Because we know the circumstances of those last weeks now mean nothing. We know her laughter. We know her joy.